At this time, I'd like uh, Pastor Reverend Dr. Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Oliver to give us a welcome, sure. please. First of all, um, how many of you had, I hadn't seen that whole, that whole piece. Anyone else not see that whole piece? Yeah, but it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to see that. Well, again, my name is Pastor Mark Oliver, and I'm my head of the entire congregation. Uh, welcome. Just coming here on this very important uh, night, I think it was. There's a, there's a proverb, I'm trying to remember in my mind right now, I think like Proverb 15, that basically says something in the order of, Good news is health to the body, and in some sense, uh, we're, we're, we're hopefully this is good news that ultimately, literally, is going to bring good health. And uh, the hope is that all of us will not only take what we learn here, take what we'll learn here, um, but uh, tell others, you know, let others know about the information that is really, really, uh, I think, critical. So I think Janet was telling me that um, that Brockton is in the state of Massachusetts the, has the highest incidences yep. of, of prostate cancer. We need to get the word out. All of us, we need to get the word out and that uh, there is an answer and there's a way to respond as if, effectively. So welcome. Thank you for coming here. Now, can I do a pastor thing and pray? Is that a, are we allowed to do that? Is that possible? Sure. All right. Let me let me let me just uh, let me keep it short. Uh, Lord, we thank you again for this evening. We thank you for gathering together. And Lord, you know how important uh, this information is for our community. I ask, Lord, that you would be with each one of our speakers, each one of our presenters, and that there would be clarity. There would be effectiveness. And that, Lord, that each of us would become messengers for this, with this important information to be able to reach individuals, touch as many homes as possible. And in that way, that there will be good news that will transform into good health and that you would be glorified in our city. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Oliver. Well, thank you very much for coming out this evening. It's good to see so many, so many friends. Uh, yes, we're going to talk about prostate cancer, which is a touchy subject. But again, we're here as brothers and sisters and, and, and loved ones. And we want to make certain that everyone has an opportunity to share the information that you have, that you receive tonight with uh, the loved ones that are not here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the history of the partnership between the the NAACP, the, the Brockton Area Branch, the Admin Tech Foundation, and uh, the Good Samaritan Medical Center. It was uh, in September of uh, 2015 uh, that the NAACP New England Area Conference uh, had their uh, annual meeting. And at the annual meeting, one of the premier speakers was Dr. Fana Stern, the uh, president and CEO of Admin Tech Foundation. And Leona Martin and I were there, I don't know if Janice, were you there also on that day? Janice usually everywhere, but she wasn't at there, <laughs> wasn't at there at this, this time. Leona Martin and I were there, and we heard the, the uh, outstanding presentation and the facts that the African Americans are, are, are a large multiple uh, uh, at risk than their Caucasian brotherhoods of uh, uh, having prostate cancer, and other statistics that were, were pretty shocking. The owner said to me, Steve, we have to have this woman come to Brockton and speak with us. Making a long story short, we have been giving presentations throughout the community for the last, last four years, and in fact, and unfortunately, have dedicated some of those uh, presentations uh, to uh, our brothers who have not survived, from uh, prostate cancer, uh, and some of those who have survived from prostate cancer. T this evening, you're gonna hear from uh, professionals uh, and lay people. Uh, uh, the professionals will be talking, talking about the innovative te technologies uh, in medicine uh, relative to prostate cancer. Uh, and the uh, lay people, if I may call you so, will be talking about uh, uh, their uh, their situations within their family and uh, or their personal situations uh, with prostate cancer. 
We're going to hear from uh, attorney Richard Lawton, who has a law practice in Brockton. We're going to hear from uh, Darren DeWatt, who's the uh, director of communications uh, at the Brockton Police Department. Uh, we are going to hear from uh, uh, Dr. Ingolf uh, Turk, who is uh, a renowned uh, urologist in, uh, in and I'm, excuse me for not giving you the full title, but it's the first, uh, first time I've met, uh, met Dr. Uh, Dr. Turk. Uh, we'll be hearing from Dr. Franco, who's a, uh, also a urologist and has a, a practice in Boston. And we'll be hearing uh, uh, from uh, Dr. St Pardon me? And Dr. Franco lives in Brockton? I, I didn't know that. Works in oh, works in Easton and, and Brockton. And of course, uh, uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Fane Stern, who's the CEO and president of, uh, of uh, Amitech uh, Foundation. Uh, I want to take just a minute to, uh, to thank all who have participated in putting this program together, because I have a habit of forgetting to give credit to everyone that's involved. And so I want to begin so I won't forget, by thanking, of course, Dr. Stern for Admitech and her staff, Santina Russell, Greta Lofgren, Thomas Satham, and from uh, Good Samaritan Medical Center, uh, Nikki Draves, and of course from the NAACP, Phyllis Ellis, Janice Trask, Janet Trask, uh, Leona Martin, uh, you all saw Joan Madden was, was here uh, earlier. Uh, I, if I've forget, forgotten anybody, I, I truly apologize. Uh, so, what I've uh, asked is because it's a very emotional period, time in my life. I'm you know, not a hundred percent. I've asked a good friend to help me with the uh, uh, the MC, the MC, and and, uh, and that is what is your name? But. <laughs> but. <laughs> but. Jason Miller, who is a Toastmaster uh, uh, in his own right uh, and a member of our, our committee. I didn't forget to mention you, I know I was going to mention you at this point, to help me with the, uh, with the timing of each, uh, each speaker so we'll be out uh, at a, a reasonable period of time. Uh, so what we'd like to do at this time uh, is to have uh, attorney, well, well, should we have the speakers? Should we have the speakers first to uh, come up here? No. Okay. What we'd like to do at this time, because there is a conflict uh, with his schedule, and he's taken time from his busy schedule to jo to uh, to speak with us, is Senator Michael Brady, who's been on board uh, with the prostate cancer effort, awareness and education here in Brockton since the start. And we thank you very much, Mike. Would you come for come forward and give us a few words? Thank you. <laughs> Good thing I'm not singing and clear the house up. Uh, thank you, Steve, and, and thank you to all the friends and family of ours that are here today. Uh, it's a very important issue, and uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, our whole state delegation has been on board with Representative Claire Cron, Representative Jerry Cassidy, Representative Michelle Dubois, and myself. And, um, if this wasn't brought to our attention, we, you know, my father suffered from prostate cancer, but he got detected early enough, and it, he was older in life, but he, he was detected early enough. Uh, he had other health issues that he passed away from having strokes later on in life, but he, he was detected early enough. But it's affected many, many people. Over 264,000 people this past year have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and over 29,000 have died in 2018 alone. And it's affected more men of African descent than any other nationality out there. And in our area, the city of Brockton has been greatly affected by it as well. So I'm glad to be on board with this and a partner with all of us. And we have to bring more attention to it because early detection is so important. So that being said, I want to thank Dr. Sun and the members of Abbey Tech for bringing it to our attention as well. Uh, educating us all because education and early detection is a priority in the research with the foundation that has been put forth. But you can't do it without funding. And as I mentioned, my delegation at the state level that we all work together. And Mike Rush, who represents West Roxbury, is on board on the Senate side with myself and as I mentioned, the, th the three representatives 
uh, Rep. Dubois, Cassidy, and Rep. Uh, Claire Crona have gone on board. So every year we fight for this funding. And last year the governor didn't put in the budget. We have amendments we put forth in the House and the Senate to get the funding. But unfortunately, the Department of Public Health didn't realize how important it is, so they didn't push the funding forward. So we had to do correspondence across the board, working across party lines, Republicans and Democrats, to show how important it was we got the funding in last year. But we're running into the same situation this year. So I know all of us are on board. It's a major priority for all of us in the state delegation to get the funding put forth again this year. And, uh, you know, you can't put, count the eggs before they hatch, but I know we'll be fighting for it from our level at the state and the Senate and uh, at the House and the Senate side. And I know it's a major priority. So though it wasn't put in the budget this year, we're going to push to put it forth. I know Jerry Cassidy is going to be filing the amendment in the House with the Brockton delegation. I'm going to be working with Mike Rush in the Senate side as well, and we're going to push to get this forward. But again, we can't do it without everybody in this room and the people that aren't here tonight, because there is a bunch of other events to attend to tonight, and I've got to go to another event where I have a present a citation to, but we got to spread the word to get early detection. It's so important. And with all of the partners here, and I know all the help you've done helping us at the State House to get this push forth, we were able to get the funding put in place last year. Unfortunately, we've got to fight again this year and get the funding put back in place this year. But with all the partners we have in the correspondence and the education of not only everybody here, but educating the public through the State House, we will be confident to get the funding put forth and continue to educate everybody out there about how important it is to get early detection for this. So I thank you all for all your participation tonight. Steve, you've been a brother to me for many years, and um, Dr. Stern and all the partners here. Thank you very much, and we're going to continue to push forward for this important endeavor. So God bless you. Hello, my name is Jason Wheeler. I'd like to start by thanking Mike Brady. He always comes out, does the right thing. I am pleased to have a chance to be here today because I have two brothers who are prostate cancer survivors. And that is everything. The name of the game is to make sure that we minimize the occurrence. But in the meantime, let's make sure as many people as possible survive. That's the key. I have the good fortune of sharing with you input that you're going to get from a number of interesting people. The first of which is Attorney Richard Lawton Esquire. Attorney Esquire, Attorney Lawton, if you could come up, please. Thanks, Steve. I, I probably don't need this because I'm loud as it is. <laughs> Should I use it? Okay, I'll use it. I'll heal you. So I was invited, and I'm, I'm flattered to be invited, but to tell a family story because I'm one of five. There are five brothers. I have four brothers. There are five of us in all. And um, my father had prostate cancer. He got diagnosed late in life, and um, it had escaped. He had it metastasized in his body, and he was on Lupron Depot for about 20 years at the late stages of his life. It didn't cause his death, but he certainly suffered with it for years. And then we later found out, my brother is a genealogical sort of wizard in a way, and he found out that my family, on both sides of my, my father's side, my mother's side, it's a prevalent disease. And, and, and I will say that we all have something, right? Everyone around us is gonna get something. So we're not immune from what happens to us. We are what we are. But um, my family has a funny experience with prostate cancer. So I had a great friend, Dr. Charles Smallwood, who was with Brockton Urology. And if you go back 30 years, the urological offices were very small. It was Dr. Smallwood, Dr. McArdle, and Dr. McCahill. There were three guys that was in a home. And, um, and this was just a quarter century ago. So in that service, the whole greater Brockton area and um, it just wasn't something that was diagnosed as frequent as it is today because people just aren't aware of it. But Dr. Smallwood and I used to go to the gym together, work out in the morning, and he knew my dad had prostate cancer. So he says, you know, Rick, I was about 38. He said, you should really get tested for prostate cancer because there's a feeling that it runs genetically in families. I said, all right, I will. So 
A friend of ours, Leon Josephs, was my primary care physician, started to do my PSA. And when I was 40, it was three, three and a half. And um, it probably should have been zero. And at 42, it was 12. So I got a call from uh, Leon Josephs, my physician. He said, Rick, your PSA was really elevated. I'm very concerned about it. He said, I called Dr. Smallwood. I want you to go to see him tomorrow. So I met him at the gym. And, he put me on Cipro, and the next thing you know, I would get diagnosed with prostate cancer at 42 years old. And it was an aggressive form because, it, as you know, prostate cancer lives on testosterone, right, Doc? And the younger you are, the higher your testosterone. So I had a very elevated uh, PSA. And um, in those days, Dr. Frankel's with us today, the technology is different. So I had what's called a radical prostatectomy, which is the old fashioned that cut you up and take it out of your lower organs. and cover the prostate with Indian ink and they'd, they'd cut you up and put you back together. The bottom line was I had a great success story. I had some after treatment after my surgery, radiation, Lupron for six months, but my story was a great one. But it became complicated years later because my oldest brother, no, I'm sorry, within a year, my brother Tom got diagnosed with prostate cancer because all of my brothers are sensitive to the fact they all started to get their PSAs done. So Tom went in, he had a radical prostatectomy, he had a low PSA, and he had a great result, he survived. And then most recently, my oldest brother, Mark, he got diagnosed and Boston Neurology um, robotically removed his prostate, but he had a, an elevated PSA, he had some problems, he had radiation and a little bit of chemical castration, they call it, or, or chemo. And then most recently, my youngest brother, Paul, so four out of five of us, have all had it. So Paul was with me tonight. Paul came, and he's a patient at Dr. Turk's. So is Dr. Turk here? Oh, so anyway, he's the patient of uh, Dr. Turk's. And um, uh, Paul's got a presentation for Dr. Turk. Um, but Dr. Turk, is a, he embodies the new technology. And my brother Paul didn't have nearly the residual disability that I had, because he's a Dr. Frank and Dr. Turk will tell you that the old days when they cut you, they cut through the abdominal muscles. And I was laid up for some time, trust me. Paul was out, Dr. Turk did a bang up job on Paul. And you would never know it. A week later, Paul, he was... In the office two days later. Yeah, he was. But truthfully, the technology is great. And now the doctors are so advanced and the technology is something that... But the point of the, of the matter is, is that <clears throat> doctors are much more advanced, they're much more knowledgeable, the technology is much more advanced than it ever was before. Darren Duarte is also a patient of Dr. Turk's. Um, he's gonna have all of his, all your patients are here tonight. But um, I guess the moral of the story is that it is, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it an epidemic, but as I said, we all get things and prostate cancer is very common and it's very common in men and um, for what reason, we don't know. Um, if it's genetic, I understand there isn't any hard concrete medical evidence that shows that it runs in families, all four or five of us got it. Um, but anyway, it's, it's health care, health insurance, good primary care physicians that send you out and do PSA tests and follow up um, is the key. You know, in early detection, as you can see from the charts behind us, that um, early detection, good treatment is the key. And, and uh, with good doctors, that it's definitely a, a cancer that we will all survive and do well with. And, um, so my brother Paul is here, Dr. Turk's here. I guess I'll pass it off. But Paul, did you want to? No, oh, he's good. All right. Yeah, thank you, Doc, for taking care of my brother. Dr. Frankel saw my brother Mark last week. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. Thank you so much for your input. It's good to hear the stories about those who survived because that should serve as inspiration to everyone here to make sure that the men in your family do what it takes so that this does not sneak up on them. I mention it that way because I'm the youngest of seven children. There are five boys in my family. They are hard-headed. <laughs> they need to be encouraged. And I use the word encourage loosely. Okay, sometimes they need to be browbeat. 
But the important thing is whatever it takes, reach out to the men in your family and encourage them. Browbeat them if need be, but do what it takes to get them to go because that's the most important thing. You would not want to have to live with the guilt that you would feel if you knew this was a crisis and it sneaked up and bit someone in your family. So do what you must, encourage them. I hope that works. But don't stop there if it doesn't. That's the important thing. With that said, the next two people I'd like to introduce are two people that know one another. One is a prostate cancer survivor, and one is a person who helps make prostate cancer survivors. I'd like to introduce Darren Duarte and Dr. Turk. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to first say uh, to everyone here, um, Rich picked up on a little bit saying, it may not be an epidemic, but for a lot of us men of color, it is an epidemic. It's an epidemic that a lot of us don't realize. And I'll tell you one thing I did not realize. I heard the stories for many years. Matter of fact, a good friend of mine, Charlie Austin, who used to be with WBZ TV, the late Charlie Austin. He used to tell me all the time in my late 20s, 30, get yourself checked, PSA checked. And I, I'd listen to him and I didn't do anything about it, really. The last few years, I would come to these events that the NAACP had with Admi Tech and Good Sam. And I'd hear the stories. And I'd hear people say, you need to get your PSA checked. Didn't do anything about it, really. I didn't think I would have prostate cancer. I really didn't. Last year, though, all that changed. Last year, I was at one of these events. Dr. Stern asked me to go to Beacon Hill to go to one of these uh, prostate cancer awareness events. I knew I couldn't make it, but I said to her and I said to myself, I'll go to the doctor and get checked. I'll do that for myself. Um, I did go ahead and do that. And when I went to go see the doctor, actually right before I went to see the doctor, I found out a cousin of mine was diagnosed with a disease. So the doctor said, oh, I got a cousin of mine who's diagnosed. Matter of fact, he's a patient of Dr. Turks as well. Um, then I said, okay, well, this is, this is genetic. I went to go see the doctor, found out that my PSA score was down a few points than it was two years prior, so I asked the doctor, my local doctor, well, what do you think? Do I have cancer? You're trending in the right direction, is what I said. But after talking to my cousin and talking to friends of mine who have the disease, including the Lawtons, I found out that my level was a cause for concern. So I went back to the doctor, and we decided Let's get a biopsy to be sure, because that's really the key. The biopsy will tell you if you have it, whether it's aggressive or not, don't have it. So we got the biopsy, and the results were shocking. It was an aggressive form, and the cancer was on the move. I was referred to Dr. Turk at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Brighton. He looked at the report, and he said, it looks like that we have everything may be still in the organ, but we don't know. We have to do other tests, and we have to act fast. There's a chance this could get out, and you don't want that. So we did act fast. Within a few weeks, we had surgery, and I'm happy to report that the pathology report came back that it didn't leak out. I'm cancer-free up to this point, and I want to thank Dr. Turk and his team for saving my life. And I, I want people to take, if they, you take nothing else from this story, because I sat here and listened to these stories, it can't be me. I mean, I didn't feel sick. Please go get your PSA checked. But more than that, you have to be your own advocate as well. You have to be your own advocate. Say, you know, in some cases, I think I want a biopsy. Uh, I won't darn the insurance, if you will. <laughs> I think I need a biopsy. That's what you, you, you can know for sure. In my case, that's what it was. Again, I want to thank uh, uh, the folks here for encouraging me, and I want to thank uh, the folks at St. Elizabeth's and Dr. Turk again for saving my life. Thanks, Doc. Uh, my name is Ingolf 
Turk and I'm uh, a surgeon at St. Louis Medical Center. So I'm uh, somewhat connected to that area via networking. And I'm uh, very, very happy and pleased to see some of my patients here. Uh, but I have to be very, very impressed about that uh, whole event tonight here. Yeah, I think, um, I was thinking, you know, I've been as a doctor to many, you know, congresses, meetings. But I think that's the right, right venue, particularly for that risk population that we are trying to address today. Um, that prostate cancer is extremely common, as we heard, 260,000 men every year, the most common cancer in men. Uh, and unfortunately, the Afro-American population is highly prevalent for that. And you may wonder, what's the reason? Uh, there's nothing special about it. You've not been a bad boy, or you haven't done anything wrong. It's just that uh, you're genetically born that way that it happens in your population. And I think that's a little bit more encouraging in this kind of venue uh, to talk about that rather than in some kind of bigger congressional institution where things are a little bit less private. So uh, I'm very impressed uh, about that event. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. And I think it's important to talk about it, particularly in the Afro-American population. And I always wonder, and maybe some gentlemen here in the front can tell us, what is the problem? Why is it such a problem for black men, for Afro-American men, to, to acknowledge that as a problem, be proactive compared to other entities? And I think, I, I know the answer a little bit maybe, there's some fear about side effects. But that, we will talk about that later. There are many treatment options for prostate cancer, including being somewhat inactive and survey actually the situation. It doesn't need to be aggressively treated all the time. And in today's time, we can minimize side effects massively to a degree that it's relatively uncommon that a man actually has permanent problems after any kind of treatment, particular surgery. So I should we take the fear out of that a little bit that uh, once you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's all over. That's not true. Uh, you can be helped uh, in many particular ways, in many different ways. It can be individualized. And I can tell you, having treated more than 4,000 men with prostate cancer, that most of them enjoying a full life after being treated for prostate cancer. The key is, it needs to be diagnosed early on. And if you're young enough, like we have heard today, it actually really can take you away. Uh, although you hear maybe stories that prostate cancer is a slow-growing cancer, it doesn't really matter, never has an impact. Unfortunately, in the Afro-American population, it comes earlier. It's somewhat more aggressive. And again, it's all genetics, unfortunately. And therefore, it's really, really key to be aware of that and be willing to acknowledge it and look for it. Also being ensured that if you got it, we can help and we can make sure you're going to be a good man afterwards with all the things that you enjoy and have a good life. I think we will talk later about some question and answers. Anything in particular? Yes, we will discuss it. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everybody's taking good notes. I hope everybody's listening real close. And I hope everybody is thinking about how they are going to motivate the men in their lives to get checked out. I say that because I had two brothers. I have, thank you God, I have two brothers, as I said, who are prostate cancer survivors. And I don't know how they found out about it. I wasn't the one who said, you need to go get checked out. But I'll tell you this, now I say to people, you need to go get checked out. And I want to encourage you to do the same. I also want to encourage you to have the women in your families reach out to the men in your families. Women have amazing powers of persuasion. I encourage them to use them, okay? <laughs> yeah, God's been kind like that. All right. The next person I have the good fortune to be able to introduce is a Dr. Ryan Frankel. And I'll let Dr. Frankel tell you a little bit about himself and his role in this practice. Doctor, would you be kind enough?
Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody tonight. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, I practice right here in Brockton. So uh, I do my surgery at the Good Samaritan Hospital and the Brockton Hospital. My office uh, is just over the line from Brockton and Easton. Uh, so many of you um, may come by my office and see me or one of my partners. So this is, uh, this is my community. It matters a lot to me. And I'm, I'm glad the people that are here tonight, I can have an opportunity to talk to you because this is my home, my medical home. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about an epidemic. So, is this an epidemic? And I would argue that it is. Because we were doing really well in prostate cancer for a long time. Prostate cancer survival uh, was improving over a 50 year period of time we were seeing we were doing a better and better job at it. But over the past 10 to 15 years, the curve has moved in the other direction, and that's really tragic, especially as it affects so many African-American men. But the, the number one way that prostate cancer gets diagnosed in this country or around the world is by the PSA test. It's a blood test. It's a um, part of a panel of tests that you would typically get at your Primary, doc, primary care doctor's office. Uh, but there's really been a, a movement, very unfortunately, from the government and from others to discourage men and discourage doctors from getting the PSA test. Which is really shocking. As we all know, we heard that prostate cancer is the leading, the number one cancer in men, number two cause of cancer death in men in this country. So. This is a, it's becoming an epidemic again because it's important that we do get an opportunity to get screened for prostate cancer. Um, what we're seeing now, and you know, I'm and Dr. Turk, we're on the front lines, what we're seeing is that we're seeing patients come in with more advanced prostate cancer, that it's spread outside of the prostate. It becomes much more difficult to treat under those circumstances. So I, I think it's very important that those of you that are here to get educated and to talk to your doctor about having a PSA test. Uh, you know, the, definitely for men over the age of 45, they should have a PSA test. It should be checked on a yearly or semi-yearly basis, depending on what age you are. And uh, probably many of you would end up coming to my office after seeing your primary care doctor and having an elevated test because, as I said, I work in this community. Um, but it is important for everybody to understand how to get the test. It's something to ask your doctor about. You know, typically, people will get uh, to find out about it through their primary care, but a lot of times, primary care physicians now are not ordering the test. They're not checking it because of some, I would consider, very bad guidance from our government among, uh, the, amongst uh, a number of agencies that have been advocating against it. Ask your doctor, I want to have a PSA test, particularly, if, as we said, if you're in the African American community, you are at a higher risk, more a higher risk of obtaining and a more aggressive form of cancer as well, so it's critical. Uh, typically, once you have an elevated PSA, as you've heard it a couple of times tonight, uh, you have a biopsy. It's not pleasant, but it's pretty easy to do. And uh, you know, it gives us all the kinds of information that we need to determine uh, how, how to best treat you. And there's a number of different ways to treat you. And as Dr. Turk alluded to, not everyone requires treatment. But uh, it is very important you have that information so that you can make plans and figure out, do you need treatment, do you need aggressive treatment, and what kind of treatment do you need? So, I'll uh, start with that, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, that was quite helpful. Now I have the good fortune of being able to introduce someone who has been instrumental in this process 
for quite some time. It is both an honor, an honor and a privilege to bring up Dr. Stern. Um, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, it is an honor for me to be given an opportunity by uh, Steve uh, Bernard, by Phyllis Ellis, by Leona Martin, by John Krask, many other leaders in uh, Brockton and ACP to be opportunity to work with local community and uh, 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 I believe we are making a difference. Uh, at this point, I would like to um, ask Dr. Frankel and Dr. Um, Eric to address the two at the uh, table. And uh, we, what we would like to do next is to actually ask you what questions you have about prostate cancer. What are your concerns? What are your suggestions to us? Uh, how to actually bring information that, uh, that is making a difference uh, to the community. Does anyone have any questions about what we just discussed? I think the most important question is, what do you do about hard-headed relatives? I'm the youngest of five boys. I got brothers who still have not gone and gone tested. After having brothers who have had. And so the question that is prevalent in my mind is, how do you motivate people to do what is in their best interest? Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Get women involved. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, I will be a little bit lighthearted here, and I would like to share a recent ad issued by one of the nonprofit advocacy organizations. Uh, and it, it was a very attractive uh, African-American couple, actually. And the legend and the beautiful uh, young woman is sitting in the lap of her husband. And the, um, and the legend uh, said, no uh, testing, no Lucas. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we had a question. We had a yeah. question. So my question is really twofold. One. What are the symptoms of uh, you know, prostate cancer? The second is, we talk about you know, the, 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 the disease being uh, uh, prevalent among African Americans. I was wondering in your study, has there any study done, been done to see if Africa, you know, in Africa, is also the disease there, or so that you know, we can determine whether it's a uh, really the origin? Uh, what country are you from, by the way? I'm from West Africa, Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> very nice. So, a uh, very good question. Obviously, um, you know, talking about a disease like cancer, you always wonder what am I looking for? What are my symptoms? So, that's a very important question, and the answer is. Unfortunately, prostate cancer doesn't make a lot of symptoms itself. But it has to do with the organ itself, where it's located and where the cancer itself originates in the organ. Uh, so itself, particularly in the early stage, you don't have symptoms. That's why we are encouraging uh, patients who have risk factors to do a blood test. Uh, unfortunately, in America and the United States, uh, we are in a situation that most of our patients today are diagnosed by PSA elevation, that's the blood test, because of the lack of symptoms. No symptoms, except the cancer is more advanced when it has grown further and will create some urinary symptoms, but often it actually be, it starts to be symptomatic once it has actually spread into your body, mostly in the bone system, uh, and it creates symptoms from that situation uh, that uh, means pain or other issues. So that's one of the issues for prostate cancer. It's not really symptomatic. It's not like brain cancer or others where you have some clear symptoms that are showing you that something is wrong. Um, the second question is, yes, absolutely. 
There are good studies uh, clearly showing that uh, the prevalence of prostate cancer is significantly elevated in Africa, all of Africa. Uh, that, again, has to do with the ethnics and the genetic situation there. So, no question that that is a problem. Anything you want to add, Brian? I guess I would just echo what I uh, just said about, you know, it's an excellent question about the symptoms of prostate cancer because there aren't symptoms. Uh, it's, it is important that uh, you talk to your primary care doctor about getting the PSA test. It's, it's really uh, the way that we identify these. And I think this, uh, this slide that you see, early detection saves lives. Uh, it's, it's true, you know, by the time you have symptoms of prostate cancer, the situation is a lot worse. So you really want to find it before that happens. Um, what I would like to point out is that uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a study, a scientific study that came out from the Veteran Administration. Uh, it, veteran Administration is seeing prostate cancer as actually service-related disease because a lot of uh, soldiers were exposed to herbicides, including Agent Orange, in all kinds of different countries. Um, they were representing our country, or they were fighting for our countries. And what was very interesting, uh, PSA testing was actually made practically mandatory uh, in the VA system in the, uh, among the military. And what they published uh, several years ago is they studied over 1,000 men, African-American men and, um, and Caucasian men. They found absolutely no difference in um, uh, mortality uh, in this way uh, between African-American and uh, um, Caucasian men for, in the system that had consistent testing, that had uh, 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 equal access uh, to testing and healthcare. Um, and that it was a fascinating model that was created for anywhere else in the country that we can deal, we can eliminate disparities in mortality between African American and Caucasian men. Um, it, why else we strongly believe it is the case? Uh, because um, in, uh, when I was at NIH, at the National Cancer Institute, uh, in the early 90s, we saw horrendous disparity in mortality between um, African-American women and Caucasian women. By now, in Massachusetts, that is universal access, of course, we developed um, uh, accurate diagnostic tools, digital mammography, test MRI, et cetera, uh, precision biopsy, and today in Massachusetts that has uh, universal access to care, there is no difference in mortality between African-American men and Caucasian women. Uh, African-American and Caucasian women. And these are very important models that gives us hope. We, we could do it in breast cancer, we could do it in the VA system for prostate cancer, we can do it everywhere. So education and awareness is therefore critical. And as was pointed out, federal agencies went against prostate cancer screening, for instance, nobody could understand. We in expert community were very concerned about high-risk populations. Uh, and that's why we undertook this large-scale awareness and education campaign to make sure that men will be what Darren had become, advocates for their health, men and their communities. Darren, please. Yeah, hi. Um, doctors are under pressure uh, from health insurance companies to not to offer biopsies that work. And here's why I have this. I've been telling people ever since what happened to me all around this country. And some of them go and get PSA tests, and they come back. And some of the numbers they give me, they can get a biopsy. Why not go to the guy should go I can wait so I'm just curious about that. Oh, uh, that's a very, very good point. Um, and uh, that's where healthcare intermingles with politics, and that's not good. Um, and uh, you have to correct, uh, there is a concern, as we already hear, 
And I was already interested. Are you checking for PSV? Your primary care physician, right? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm oh, I'm so sorry. I saw you. Sorry. No. It is the first but, time Yes. Okay. Um, but anyway, yes, as you heard for him, there was uh, what we call a um, task force um, collected by the, by the US government looking at, and that was about what, uh, six years, eight years, ten years ago. The US task force, 2011. Yes, so uh, was, there was, uh, uh, the US government wanted to look at uh, the situation of PSA and the PSA screening, so early detection of prostate cancer saves lives, uh, given the prevalence, prevalence of prostate cancer. So there was a group of uh, specialists called, I, uh, I don't think there was a urologist actually involved, there was just a general, uh, general, uh, general practitioners, no urologist. Guess that. Huh? Uh, there's a part of prostate cancer, but there's no expert actually in there. Um, but anyway, they looked at studies, uh, predominantly US studies, with relative short follow up time, which did not show statistically in that studies a survival benefit of early detection. But the problem was that the studies they selected were not representative enough. Um, and you look overseas in Europe where has been uh, studies done much longer and better done as far as statistics is concerned. It's a whole another science for itself, statistics, how you do all that. Uh, it turns out that there is clear evidence. Prostate cancer, as we know, or some of you know, is a relative slow-growing cancer. Uh, it does not kill right away, except it's aggressive then that's actually a bad boy that can actually really go very fast. But typically it's a relatively slow growing cancer. You can live this cancer sometimes 10 years or longer before it actually takes your life. But if you are diagnosed it early enough or early in your age and you follow it long enough, you will see a difference. So that the, 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 you know, the message of the whole thing is there is a concern. It is discouraged, as uh, Dr. Frank already said, to look at PSA. Uh, but the evidence actually worldwide suggests that PSA screening does save life and it should be done. Uh, and yes, because of that regu you know, regulation or recommendation from the US government, insurance certainly looks more critical of that and says, uh, why? Uh, no PSA. I'm not covering PSA for this gentleman. And if there is a concern on PSA, um, no, we are not covering biopsy, possibly. That's, that's a real problem as far as uh, you know, the daily activities is concerned. And there's another little issue as to what the PSA itself is supposed to be. As you already pointed out a little bit, that fluctuates. And actually, the PSA of four is not necessarily the cutoff for everybody. It's age-related. A gentleman of 42 should not have a PSA of four. He shouldn't have a PSA more than 0 0.5. That's the cutoff for a man in the 40s, not four. All right, so there's a lot of misinformation and other things going on that uh, makes it certainly very, very good pointing out, difficult sometimes for an individual to navigate through that and, uh, you know, have his right to be taken care of in the proper way. No question. Yes, please. Uh, in, to if someone had an elevated PSA test and a subsequent, subsequent biopsies, as a radiologist who led development of MRI, of course, my question will be what kind of biopsy it was. Was it done blindly, without imaging, or was it done under guidance of magnetic resonance imaging? Uh, and these are, uh, what we have shown is uh, that with magnetic resonance imaging, we are able to uh, do what we do in any other organ but the prostate routinely. We can see exactly where lesion is and we send biopsy needle exactly that as opposed to sampling this blindly. Our mission of our organization was to end blind prostate cancer care. And we did through development of MRI. Right now, MRI is recommended by uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which, is, uh, which consists of top 27 cancer hospitals and top, top experts. So the first question to ask, how biopsy was done? Was it done blindly? When we can, the best we can, 
is to sample 0.5% of the organ randomly, this is not a very helpful information. So the first question I would ask, was biopsy done under MRI guidance? If biopsy was done with, without MRI guidance, it is a problem from my perspective. This was not the current state of the art biopsy. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's actually a very good question again uh, from this gentleman because that's a, current, a very common occurrence. Uh, you're a relative young man, you go to the office, the doctor is scared like hell anyway. Uh, he, PSA comes back, is elevated. Oh God, now I'm in trouble. He gets a biopsy done and it's negative. And you say, oh, yeah, I don't have cancer. But that's actually not necessarily true, as Shorey pointed out. Um, that uh, the biopsy itself is random. Uh, it's randomly poking in your prostate 12 times. It's a relatively small amount of tissue you're receiving. And while it sounds good that your biopsy is negative, but your PSA remains elevated, uh, as you're not out of the out of danger zone at this point in time. And uh, your your physician or your physician group should then certainly um, you know communicate with you properly. And I totally agree uh, with Dr. Stern that uh, one of the things that you probably want to do after a negative biopsy is getting an MRI of your prostate. Uh, because that will actually show more better if there is some uh, concern that the biopsy actually did not uh, detect. So having an elevated PSA and a negative biopsy does not mean you're good. It's, it's, it's an encouraging result in that moment, gives you peace of mind, but if the PSA remains elevated, you, it, I would encourage you and your physician to continue looking. Uh, and MRI is a way to do it, as well as uh, MRI-guided biopsy if there's concern, a repeat biopsy. We can talk more about it uh, uh, if you want to. It goes also into details what kind of tissue was detected. Negative is not necessarily negative. They see sometimes precancerous cells. It's negative for cancer, but their cells, they're already a little bit suspicious in a certain direction that warrants a biopsy right away. Ideally, with image-guided today, absolutely. We're much better than we used to be. So um, I would uh, suggest that um, there should be follow-up uh, and imaging probably MI of your prostate is highly warranted if the PSA continues to be high and the biopsy negative. Uh, yes, please. It's actually, Doctor, uh, I was diagnosed through an MRI and my insurance company wouldn't cover it because I hadn't had the biopsy beforehand. So they gave me the option of paying for the MRI myself. Now, the reason I decided to do that was because I had people telling me horror stories about the nature of the uh, biopsy procedure, which were really stories that I found weren't true at all. So I decided to pay for the MRI. They diagnosed me with a lesion. I then went in so they were able to target the uh, biopsy. And the biopsy turned out to be absolutely nothing at all. It was a little uncomfortable. It was nothing. As a matter of fact, uh, it was, this is something I gotta tell people. You have people that may have had these procedures done 20 years ago, like my brother Rick, you know, completely different surgical procedures, different techniques and so forth. They tell you stories, you don't listen to them. And I told, I've told people, don't, tell people these stories. You know, they, they seem to think that it's funny, and it's not funny. It discourages people from going and having these procedures. And I'm a medical uh, chicken. I, I cringe when I drive my hospitals from things that, you know, when we were kids and we had procedures done. So I decided to have the MRI, I paid for it, they diagnosed it, I went in, I was all, uh, 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 had this procedure. I had the doctors performing it, rolling on the ground with stories as this thing was going on. I was out there in 15 minutes. I told my wife, I said, that was nothing. They were able to go in. They targeted the area. I immediately contacted the best doctor that was referred to me uh, and had to, went in and, and hit it very aggressively because if we had a family history. We do the way you have to treat these, particularly when I went in and my Gleason score was a nine out of 10. Doc, 
Dr. Uh, Turek told me and his staff told me, look, this is very aggressive. I told, I said, Doc, I know what, I'm, I'm not going through seeds, I'm not doing anything else. I want this removed immediately. He says, that's the way we gotta do it. I'll tell you, with robotic surgery, the way they go in nowadays, I, I had no pain afterwards. It was really, it was remarkable. I was out of the, uh, out of the hospital the following day. I was back at work the subsequent day. I had no pain, uh, side effects, virtually none at all. I'm completely recovered three months later. I just had my PSA done last week. It's undetectable, undetectable. <laughs> you know, any diagnostic test that you can do, get it done. Don't listen to people that had this stuff done 20 and 30 years ago So this is the worst thing. It's like them shooting a nail gun inside you, which is what they told me, right? So I'm like, a nail gun inside you. I'm not going to have that done, right? I went in there, like I said, it was absolutely nothing. The techniques, the procedures that they have nowadays are so advanced, and is it, with the microsurgery, the doctors there, they have a robot do the stuff. It's minimally invasive. They're doing stuff on almost a microscopic level. So you leave. I'll tell you, I've had teeth extracted that were a worse experience than this doc, I gotta tell you. And uh, just don't, if you have, hear people telling other people in the family those kind of stories, discourage them immediately, say don't do that. That is counterproductive. That could cause somebody in their life. I lost two close friends of mine last year, all right? One was Chief Bob Hayden, the former chief in Brockton, and another friend of mine from the Plymouth County House of Correction who was only 47 years old who had a uh, very aggressive form, and they both passed away. Now this was, I went to both their wakes within a month of each other, two months before I was diagnosed. So immediately I'm like, oh my God, I've had it in my family. You don't take this stuff lightly. Get yourself and your family, make sure they get tested. Assure them that techniques and procedures nowadays are so advanced, they're really, they're nothing to worry about at all. It's really, it, it's, it's, it's so cool nowadays, and as I said, the side effects, Doc, I, the cap, you know, this is stuff, it's sensitive stuff to talk about, capitalization, that was the most uncomfortable thing. For six days, let me tell you, that was the only thing that drove me crazy. The next day, I had it removed, I had no incontinence, Doc, none whatsoever, I had no side effects, and you told me, you said because of the aggressive nature, yeah. you said, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna wipe out everything around the capsule. He says, look, I'm gonna go in. I said, yeah, do it. Take out as much as you can. Maybe I'll lose five pounds in the process. <laughs> <laughs> so he did, and I'll tell you what, Doc. I'm like, it's almost like nothing ever happened. You know what I mean? And I feel absolutely great today. Three months later, I'll completely recover. I have to tell you. <laughs> You know that you got lucky, right? Oh, yeah. But, uh, you have a question? Yes, uh, I have a question. In the, um, I'm part of the veteran community, and um, also, like Dr. Stern was saying, these are uh, yearly tests that we are all required to take. One of my veterans came to me and he was like, my PSA is a 10. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, my PSA is 10. I said, well, you gotta go get that checked out. And he didn't know anything about prostate cancer. He's a Vietnam two-time tour uh, veteran. And I was wondering, because he was explaining to me that he's, uh, when he's urinating, and I was thinking, because I was trained under this institution of uh, NAACP, and pro uh, prostate cancer awareness, that the prostate enlarges. Does that enlarge and press against the bladder and causes you know, uh, some of the problems when you're urinating? So I was, I was questioning, I said, well, he told me that first, and I said, go get your PSA done. He didn't even know what it was. Got it done and came back at 10. Uh, this is the gentleman's life that we saved. And I kept on him, I called him up, go get this done. He went and found out he had prostate cancer. He did survive. So these tests are being uh, performed on us also. But my question is, the digital rectal exam still uh, valuable or is it, that's a problem. You don't that's right. Exactly. Drink, right in. Very good question. But <laughs> can we be honest here? With, uh, the, isn't that one of the issues of your brothers? Yes. 
Yes. Even though they have a low PSA, but so, should they still do that? Yes. And that's, you know, you bring up a very good point. Uh, the story that you are, you know, explaining to us is, is a typical one. And uh, I mean, obviously, we're all grateful that you are an advocate in that uh, area and really pushing your brothers to do it. Unfortunately, even in 2019, uh, we doctors don't know everything and we're not perfect. And the PSA test is far from perfect as well. It's a good test, it's a solid test, but it's not necessarily uh, always showing you know, what's going on. And that's why the digital rectal examination, unfortunately, uh, is highly recommended as well, because sometimes prostate cancer develops without producing elevated PSA. Most of the time it does produce elevated PSA, but there are unfortunately some fewer ones, and unfortunately they are often more aggressive actually. Uh, uh, so they actually need to be detected, and then the only way that we actually figure out that there is a real problem is by unfortunately doing that uh, very pleasant investigation um, from the rear end. And I believe, and again, I mean, I think it's very important to talk in this community. As I said, I like the setting in the church, where I believe uh, African-American uh, is a population with faith, and uh, that's probably where they're congregating often, and, and talking about it is important. But I, as I said, I think that's one of the issues. Jason, what's your name, right, Jason? Yeah. That he said, can you tell me how to convince your brothers? Yeah, take the fear of that investing, you know, and that evaluation away. Don't, you know, let's not, let's not, you know, uh, have that cultural thing going on, or well, no, uh, this guy is not gonna, you know, do this with me. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we gotta break that barrier and talk to them. Listen, you know, uh, it's gonna happen. Uh, other than that, uh, you're gonna die uh, much earlier, and you're not gonna see your kids or grandkids live, live. So uh, then, let's, uh, you know, convince that community that it's okay, it's okay uh, to do that. And also, again, the surgery itself, uh, or not surgery, just the treatment, sorry, not just treatment, although I'm a surgeon, that's all I do, but uh, there are other treatments that the side effects are not that bad anymore as you know, compared to 20 years ago, where men had treatment, unfortunately, did not recover well and did not feel like that their life is worse um, as, you know, as much as it was before, as far as quality of life is concerned. That's all changed, massively changed. Men are doing much better. You said that in my 40s, my PSA was 0 0.5. In my late 50s, it's 1.09. So uh, I'm still watching it every year. No, but uh, you're actually good. You're in, you're, in a good uh, you're in a good window. If your PSA was this 40s, 0 0.5, and it's now 1.09, uh, this in the 50s, uh, you are projected of having a relatively low chance of having prostate cancer. I haven't got the date yet. So. <laughs> That's a problem. We can do that in the parking lot if you want. You asked the question, what's happening to brothers? Since we're in the, the, the house of God, Solomon said it best. What's happening is vanity. Thank you. <laughs> you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Uh, you, you were just speaking. No, no, no. Uh, Paul, Paul, Paul. Paul was talking about how. Uh, you know, it felt like a nail gun being shot inside of you. And I think there probably is some truth to that from what it was like before. And I think that, I think that's really a very good point. Um, you know, once you get the elevated PSA and having that biopsy, and I think there, it, I think it's very true that I hear it from a lot of patients, oh, I don't want to have that done. I heard some story about someone, it's terrible, worst thing they ever did in their life. And I think that what we were doing 20 years ago, it was like that. Uh, but now we, and I think it's, it's good to compare it to having a tooth pulled, like you said. We now are able to numb up the prostate in such a way that you barely feel anything at all. So uh, I think that some of this concern that people have about having a biopsy and how that's gonna be done and how terrible experience it's gonna be, dates back to the time when we weren't numbing up the prostate. It was a whole different experience. So uh, I think, and, and I, I have done many biopsies on patients that have had previous biopsies before the numbing was, they had the first one before the numbing, subsequent one afterwards. It's a totally different experience. And so I think where you, where you hear someone saying, oh, it's so terrible, it's so painful, it's so awful, 
you know, what technique was used, I think, is a really a critical part of, of determining that. Um, one other thing to mention is that, you know, as far as the diagnostics go, uh, diagnosing prostate cancer, to mention the PSA, and certainly that's, that's the number one, and there's the MRI is also very important. There's, there's some additional testing uh, that has been developed over the past five to 10 years that have really added additional uh, pieces of information. There's, uh, there's a blood test called a 4K score. Uh, there is a, a PHI score, there's another blood test. There's some urine-based testing that's available now. And so uh, for those patients that have had a biopsy and it came back negative, there's so many additional tools that we have to try to determine things absent doing another, uh, another biopsy. So there, there's just a lot more tools we have available to us to, to figure this all out. In the past, uh, one of the criticism and reasonable criticism uh, of prostate cancer care uh, was that um, there were a lot of unnecessary biopsies in a lot of men uh, before, um, a number of years ago. All of this, and based on that, or unnecessary treatment, uh, and based on that, um, the recommendation was made to stop PSA testing. The problem is that PSA testing, actually the great thing, that if you look at the pattern of death rate from prostate cancer, uh, PSA testing was introduced on a large scale at around 1992. By 2012, 2013, we started seeing more than 50% decrease in death rates from prostate cancer. Actually, we looked, if you look at any other screening for any other cancer, this is probably the greatest success story in any cancer historically. And yet, uh, what the thinking that went into stopping PSA was completely beyond any expert understanding because we all understood that the solution to improve prostate cancer is not to stop PSA screening that saves lives. It was to develop accurate diagnostic tools that uh, Dr. Frankel just noticed and Dr. Turk um, just uh, mentioned. So that if PS PSA is doing its job actually rather beautifully, but PSA is not meant to be precise. It is meant to be done in normal people without symptoms to determine to improve determination of the risk of prostate cancer. Now, when PSA is abnormal or physical examination is abnormal, shows uh, something suspicious on digital rectal exam, we have a wide array of precise diagnostic tools from blood tests to imaging that can help us determine whether or not biopsy is necessary or not. And some of this tool reduced unnecessary biopsy, 60%, 80%. Uh, in addition, we have imaging to guide a biopsy needle precisely so that right now we can, uh, in, in the best MRI institutions around the world, um, uh, they demonstrated that uh, uh, in our clinical study here in Massachusetts with Brigham and Women's Hospital, we actually demonstrated that uh, MRI can improve diagnosis of little prostate cancer nearly five times compared to standard diagnostic tools, by 80%. If we look at large clinical trials involving institution of various quality of MRI, we will see that at least one third of, one -third of men never had to do biopsy again. Um, same thing with blood tests. In addition to improving diagnosis of aggressive prostate cancer, they also reduce unnecessary biopsy and unnecessary treatment. So fundamental solution that we have undertaken as an organization is not is to actually fight against stopping prostate cancer and then, uh, prostate cancer screening and instead focusing on development accurate diagnostic tools imaging, blood test, urine test, et cetera, et cetera.
Uh, oh no, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, that uh, you know, prostate cancer being as prevalent as it is has been always a subject of great research efforts, and um, there has been a significant amount of progress made over the last ten years uh, in detecting tools for prostate cancer as well as in uh, tools utilizing to determine how bad or good this thing is and what the need of treatment is for prostate cancer. So I absolutely agree, um, that's efforts ongoing and I hope that uh, the brothers would come to the office more often if the finger is not necessary anymore. Is that true? If the finger is not necessary anymore, yeah, would right. the brothers come more to the office? Yeah. Good. So that's our goal, and that's where we're actually going. That uh, you know our tools are being developed uh, more accurately, and uh, not necessarily being relying on a fingertip uh, or on a blood test that's not as specific uh, for that. Uh, any other questions, please? We have uh, a couple of uh, yes, please. Question I have is not quite in your area, but it affects your area. Um, one of the probably most things that stop most people would be insurance, money, uh, also possibly you know, access is another one. If your insurance isn't going to pay for it, or they will only pay for certain things, what suggestions do you have to overcome that? That's a serious piece. We got some of the best hospitals in the world right here. Six miles away, you get a hospital and take care of business with no problem. But if you can't afford, then what? Well, you know, it's interesting. There's a uh treatment that I do for benign prostate disease, help people with urination, and it's a newer treatment. And uh, I've gotten a lot of pushback from hospitals, or, I'm sorry, from insurance companies about my ability to do this test or do this procedure. And frankly, I spent a lot of time talking to doctors in, in insurance companies. There are doctors that work in insurance companies that can review these kinds of things to determine if it's appropriate or not. And a lot of times I find that uh, I'm successful in convincing the insurance company to pay for certain things. You really, a lot of the times, just good old fashioned, you know, pounding the pavement. Um, and, you know, me as a doctor, I'm going to get a lot of effect on it. You as a patient, you as a member of a certain uh, insurance organization may be even more effective. So a lot of times, you know, file those appeals, fight for what you want to have done, and, you know, you'd be surprised what you can get, get done that way. Yes. So, on a... For a second, we had somebody else just, raising his hand. Hello, please, just, please. Just one quick question, because I'm, I'm a little confused. I just had my physical two months ago, and Beth Israel has discontinued the digital exam for, for so they said that it's because of some literature that recently came out. So is that true? I mean, that's what my doctor, I, I, you know, I was new, bracing up, getting ready. He said, what are you doing? I'm like, you know. So what kind of testing did they do? Do you remember? Just the, uh, uh, the PSA? Yeah. Um, On 1.1. Um, so well, how old are you? 52. Oh, gotta watch. <laughs> but uh, no, there's no consensus at this point in time. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, in the medical world is used is uh, recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of organizations, including urology organizations or cancer organizations, have guidelines. Uh, and uh, that's what uh, we basically use often as tools to uh, manage a patient properly as far as screening or treatment is concerned, uh, because they're standardized uh, and they're empirically developed based on evidence. And currently, the digital examination is still part of screening for prostate cancer. So maybe the eye knows something that don't know yet, but um, so uh, yeah, then, so again, it's, it's not necessarily that it's, um, I wouldn't say it's absolutely mandatory or necessary. All I can tell you is that there's still some prostate cancers out there, they are not developed by PSA, or not uh, detected by PSA, and the only way that we found out that there's a problem is having felt a nodule on the prostate. Thank you.
until we have actually a really more accurate tools, I would still recommend that being part of a typical screening for a risk population. Um, so to me, uh, I would still include it at this point in time. Okay, we probably have time for one or two more questions, so if there's anyone else out there yeah, something Before we will proceed, if I can please uh, just uh, turn it into what uh, men can do in the face of physicians telling them that we have no sufficient evidence to do digital rectal exam, okay? What you can do is to ask your physician what is, you know, I was at an educational event and I understood from a prominent urologist, or several of them, uh, that uh, uh, in some patients, digital rectal exam can be helpful. In some patients, blood tests may not show prostate cancer, while physical or digital rectal examination can. Would you, what do you think about that? Do you think it would be still possible for you to consider doing digital rectal exam on me as a, high, as a man at high risk of aggressive prostate cancer? Yes, please. Okay, so at what point, at what point you need to start getting worried? At night, when you go to the, uh, <laughs> when you go to, to the bathroom, once or twice or three, I mean, is one time normal or when you go more than once, you have to get up more than once, it's, you know, you need to be worried. That's one question. The second is, I really honestly think, and I keep on saying this every year when we come to these things here, at some point we need to really, you know, include prostate, you know, cancer into the curriculum, especially in area for, for high school students so that you know at early stage they are aware particularly in an area where there's a lot of african-american students thank you yeah so in regards to the question of how how many times is too many times is okay to wake up at night to urinate uh you know it's, it's really a, a quality of life question by and large the number of times that you wake up at night to urinate do not necessarily correlate with prostate cancer uh, you know, as, as, as I said, Dr. Turk said, Dr. Stern, we all, by and large, prostate cancer as symptoms occur only late in the disease. So once you get to the point where you have symptoms, it's much more difficult to treat. That, your question relates to, there's all kinds of things we can do for, uh, you know, urinary complaints, and I do a lot of that. Uh, and, you know, for one person, one time is too much. For another person, four times, they don't care. So. It's really a quality of life issue and what you can tolerate and what's important. Do you want to be on medicine? Do you want to have surgery? Can you afford it? I mean, there's a lot of different factors that, that are taken into consideration along those lines. 